Sean Stewart. Thank you. I really appreciate being invited here by Tim and the rest of the people running this convention. It's uh, such a pleasure to come. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about home theater. Um, but I mean that in a different way than we usually mean it. I mean literally turning your home into a stage where exciting, adventurous, amazing, imaginary things can happen. Um, I have a slightly peculiar take on these things arguably because I'm a peculiar person, but I like to think history plays a role. So I'm going to start by telling you a tiny bit about myself and expanding a tiny bit on, about what Tim was saying, just because it, it affects my design sensibilities and the way I see the future and gives you a solid base to argue with me on. The other thing we're conducting an experiment on is um, I like building social experiences um, as much as I started as a novelist, which is the ultimate single-player experience, I also like building multiplayer experiences. So today, we're building multi-power, a uh, multiplayer PowerPoint. The clicker doesn't work, so I will say, ding, and then the slide will advance. We may level up, so sometimes I'll use different cues, maybe one of you in the audience will have to do it, you never know. So, this is the very short story of my life. Um, I got a copy of The Hobbit on my seventh birthday. It was amazing. I then went and read The Lord of the Rings, and I had a very clear life goal, which was to go to Middle Earth. It worked out poorly for me, and I was allergic to horses, which broke my heart. So, the chances of being a knight seemed to be decreasing every day, so I settled on the next best thing, which is I was going to write stories like that and bring other people into those kinds of worlds. Um, by the time I was in college, I put myself through college um, writing murder mystery dinner theater and running LARPs for money and occasionally being Alfred the Christmas Elf at shopping mall promotions. As you can tell, dignity was not an important part of my <laughs> thing. Um, I then went on uh, to indeed become a writer and I published a bunch of ding science fiction books, um, which sort of covered a range from young adult and thriller and sci-fi and fantasy, and importantly, Yoda, Dark Rendezvous, the only Yoda-focused Star Wars novel. So, I will answer all your Yoda questions at another time, but no, I will not do the voice. Ding! I know it's terribly disappointing, right? Um, in 2000, I just, I got to warm up for it. Um, ask me to tell you the story about the fishnet stockings and handcuffs and Yoda later. Um, in 2001, I got a phone call from a guy at Microsoft Game Studio saying, um, we have this incredibly innovative project that demands world-class storytelling. So we asked that guy, but he said no, but he said he had a broke friend that was you. Um, so I got, a, I got referred by a science fiction writer named Neil Stevenson to work with the Microsoft people on what became the first alternate reality game, which was a giant project we did for Steven Spielberg's AI. I'm going to tell you a tiny bit more about how ARGs have traditionally worked, just because it informs my design peculiarities. Um, normally, as it says up on the slide, we tell stories in scenes. Boy meets girl, they fall in love, boy is kidnapped by aliens, girl gets rocket launcher, girl rescues boy, they live happily ever after, right? You've seen it a million times. Um, an ARG works the same way, we organize scenes, but these scenes come through the channels of your ordinary life. So to give you an example of how that first game started, Perhaps you were a Spielberg fan or a Kubrick fan, and if you were either of those things, you hated the other guy. And you were browsing and you saw the poster for the upcoming AI film, and on it, in the credit block, you saw something that said, Janine Sala, sentient machine therapist. It was 2001, so that sounded weirder then. Now it sounds like a thing I have to go do at the Apple store. At the time, it was very odd. So you would take if you were a curious person, you would type sentient machine therapist into Alta Vista, because that's how long ago this was. Um, and you would find the webpage of Janine Sala, who worked 
as a lecturer as well as practicing sentient machine therapy at the New York campus of Bangalore World University. Somewhere in there it would occur to you this is not real, and yet nothing about it said it wasn't real. Um, in fact, because we had a friend on the DNS server, even the DNS server entries claimed to be in 2042. So you could who is to your heart's content, however hacksaw you were, and it still said 2142. So this led out to a web of sites, all set in the world of 2142. And also on this page was Ginny and Sala's phone number, so you could call her up. And when you did that, you got a piece of voicemail that said, I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get back to you. I'm out of town at the funeral of a, my dear friend, Evan Chan. And uh, I, I just can't concentrate on, on a lot of other correspondence right now. So then you'd run over to, let's call it Dogpile this time. And you'd put in a search for Evan Chan. And then up would come an autopsy report for Evan Chan, saying that he died under very mysterious circumstances. And right about that point, your phone would ring. And you would pick it up, and someone would say, you shouldn't ask any more questions about this. So it's coming to you in your life, right? It's your phone. It's your browser. You're, you're driving the car. Um, maybe you get an email. Um, you eventually followed the story of uh, Janine's granddaughter, um, Laya. And one of the things that happens when you make a story that involves these kinds of channels is it becomes very personal ding. I like the dings. They give a kind of incantatory effect, don't you think? So it becomes personal. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, about two months into the story, Janine died. By this point, a lot of the players were on what we would now think of as a server or a, a listserv um, that Laya would type out her thoughts and feelings. And, and she wrote and talked about the death of her grandmother. And the next day, when I checked her inbox, she had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of condolence emails. Nobody writes to Hamlet to tell him, dude, you need to chill out about your dad. Because Hamlet's a character in a fictional story. Lyle was as real as your cousin who lives in Cleveland that you only email with or text with and you rarely see. So right around that time, I began to think, I'm doing something very different from what I was doing when I was writing books. There's something very hot about this relationship, fictively. In fact, so much so that, ah, oh, see, I changed the interaction modality and it still worked. Every time I publish a book, the best thing that can happen for me is like maybe I get a good review in the New York Times or I've won a couple of awards. That's been sweet. Every major alternate reality game I've written, I've been invited to a wedding. Because two people met playing the game, fell in love, and the story of their relationship was so intimately bound up with their passionate engagement in the game that they wanted the people who made the game at their wedding. This is what we call immersive. I don't mean to pressure you, but if you're still in immersive media in 10 years and you haven't been invited to a wedding, you need to find another line of work. That's the bar. Just throwing it out there. All right. This is the moment which you, hey, that slide doesn't work on this presentation. All right. Uh, another thing you learn how to do is correct a lot of mistakes on the fly or usually just claim that that was totally intentional because the bleeding of the text into the fic... Anyway. OK, next slide. The point I want to make about this, considered as a formal diagram, is that we've changed bit by bit the nature of what we mean by the relationship between the art and the artist. On the slide marked then, that's how we used to think of it. I create a work of art which is then multiplied through an industrial process like a printing press making a book or someone pressing a CD or someone making a print of a film that is put out into the world and then people sit there like you're sitting there right now and they admire it. Listen, I'm this guy. I love that feeling. However, that is not wholly the world we live in anymore. We have necessarily begun to cede a lot of power to the audience. And there has occurred bit by bit, there has occurred and is occurring and will continue to occur, a Copernican revolution that puts the audience in the middle and the rest of the art orbits around them. 
I just gave you a big fancy example of someone where you're sitting in your apartment and yet all the pieces of this story are flying in as phone calls or emails or whatever. Here's another way to say this. When a show is on Tuesday at 8, how many of you now watch it Tuesday at 8? How many of you watch it whenever the hell you want? Right? Power has shifted. Now the audience is in the center and the artwork circles around them. This is an important part of my design aesthetic and also the ARG stuff and my background in improv theater makes me very willing to think about designing experiences that use that co-opt lots of things from your environment and lots of kinds of technology as long as they are focused on making a single unified experience from the point of view of the user. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? Okay, next slide. I just want to emphasize that idea of putting the user in the center, pulling all the things towards them, and going on to build the work of art you're making. Let's move on, because I think I talked it already. I had a thesis that people like things to be easy. I'm going to trust that's relatively self-explanatory. Um, it has to do with how many of you watch that show Tuesdays at 8. But here's a more famous example from film. This is movie tickets sold. In 1945, we went to 30 movies a year. That number dropped off a cliff um, and has stayed relatively constant since 1960. What happened between 1945 and 1960? that made the difference? Television. Television, right? Turns out you can have the movies, but in your house on your couch for cheaper, and you can watch them with your family, and the price doesn't go up. Um, I like going to films. I imagine most people here do, and yet people like things to be easy and convenient. Um, next slide. So we developed this thing that we call in American English, I don't know if it's the same idiom over here, home theater, which doesn't actually mean home theater. It means home cinema. It means I have a big TV screen and I have some big speakers and the experience I have at home is just as good at the one in the cinema. I would like to modestly propose an alternative. We are entering a generation where your home can actually be a theater, a stage in which we have genuine interactive engagement in stories um, using things like the Magic Leap headset, TM, um, AR and MR technology, uh, things like the Alexa, so sorry Dave, parts of this talk are going to be so hard for you, um, Alexa and Google Home apps that allow you to synchronize what's going on in your house, turn on sounds in other rooms, um, lower the lights up and down with uh, Internet of Things, and our ability to increasingly create, capture, and display characters. Um, even I can get pretty good AR characters on this now, because chips are getting better, and what's Moore's Law? Every year and a half, they'll get twice as good. Um, we're beginning to be able to have a different kind of entertainment possibility. So, let's go to the next slide. Um, you will recognize parts of this story because repetition is an important part of storytelling. Uh, Neil Stevenson, that same science fiction author, is the chief futurist at Magic Leap. And he was sitting down with the CEO and the chief creative officer at Magic Leap saying, what the hell are we going to do with like storytelling? Because like normally in a film or or even in VR, like, you're there. I take you to Westeros or Middle Earth, and you're there and you're in the world and you're absorbed and you watch it or you participate in it, depending on where you are. But here you're always going to be you, sitting in your pajamas in your apartment. And somehow it's still got to be amazing, and how do we tell that story? And Neil said, I think I know a guy, which is how I came to be involved in Magic Leap. I walked into Magic Leap on the first day. They said, OK, in your opinion, what should mixed reality storytelling be? And of course, the first answer is a negative one. It should be not stuff that we already do super well on other things, right? We shouldn't make television for mixed reality. We actually, another sidebar, actually, we do a really cool thing for television and mixed reality. You can talk to me later. You get the general point, right? If it's a really, really good video game on console, probably we shouldn't do that, because that is not broken. Television is not broken. 
virtual reality, we're not going to do mixed reality storytelling that's better at virtual reality than virtual reality is. So first off, let's make projects you can't make in another medium. So let's also find a more positive definition. That means that the fact that you are sitting there in your apartment in your flip-flops and jean shorts can't kill the experience. Ideally, it should add to the experience. Does that make sense? We don't just pretend it doesn't happen. We don't just port a video game onto a tabletop and it looks cool as a hologram. I mean, we will, we should, people should make that, but that's not the end goal, right? The end goal is to leverage the fact that you're sitting there in your flip-flops in your living room and make that a good thing. So they said, if you had one project you could build just like tomorrow with our team, what would it be? And I suggested hide and seek. The experience of I am in the kitchen, I count to 100, and then I run through my house and I look for Gandalf. Uh, is not something I can do on my PlayStation, right? Um, here's something when I'm watching TV I never do. Oh my god! That felt fun to me. That felt like a thing that would be really nice to do. Put me in a house elf in my house and let's leverage the fact that I know where to hide and I know where to look. So taking that as a test case, let's take about talk about the pieces that you would need to build that. One is you have to have an awareness of the space, right? The game itself needs to know what this geometry is and how to use it. Secondly, I need someone to play with. So you have to have someone to interact with. And thirdly, you have to have a way to interact, whether that's controllers or using your voice. There's got to be a bridge between you, the game, and the character. So talking about those in order, next, let's start with spatial awareness. I work with a bunch of guys in Seattle. Um, Neil runs a little uh, orbital station for Magic Leap out of the Seattle office, including some wonderful and clever developers um, who have been working on solving this problem. Um, next slide. It's Goat Labs. You can see the motto, Bleating Edge Tech. Um, it was founded on a very important, I would say, fundamental principle of mixed reality, which is, wouldn't it be bitchin' cool to have little tiny baby goats running around your house? Like, wouldn't that be awesome? And if you don't think that's foundational, go to the internet, type in buttercup, and you will be converted. However, beyond the basic awesomeness of cute baby goats in your living room, it also gives us a template to solve the spatial awareness problem, because to make that work, we had to build code that would make almost everything else we want to build in this space work. So next slide. The trick with all this stuff is putting virtual objects in a real space and making them able to interact, right? If I see a hovering object and it goes into the middle of the table and I can still see it hovering there, it doesn't know where the table is, doesn't know it's supposed to be hidden, that's a fail, right? That's not the experience we're looking for. We want those two things to be able to talk to one another, the virtual world and the physical world. Or, in this case, we want to see baby goats running around a real environment and knowing that it's there. So I'm going to cue a video in, in, let's call it, 10 seconds, and just watch to see the baby goats like disappear when they go behind things and the like. OK, go. So everything in this room is real, except the goats. So he went behind the chair and you don't see him anymore. He comes out and you do see him. They're up on the table, they jump down. Um, they actually land on the table. Uh, you don't see their body parts. They don't move through one another. That's all because the space and the virtual objects are talking to one another. The good news is everyone's gonna have to do this who wants to work in MR space and we have already sort of fixed a lot of this problem for you. Next slide. The guys in Seattle, Matt, um, Scott, and his team have built something called the Dense Mesh Adapter. So what it does is it scans the room and returns a mesh and then translates that mesh into game engine primitives, both for Unity and Unreal. Um, the Unity guys will be thinking about the Mars project, which is attempting a very similar class of thing. And in fact, we're working with Unity on this. Um, 
the point of assigning, in other words, you have a mesh, but having a mesh isn't enough for a game engine to know that you should treat that as a wall, and then if you throw a ball, it will have physics and bounce, right? So we've built that layer, and this code sample is out there, so you basically you can just take it down and use it, so you don't have to reinvent all the stuff. Lastly, it assigns points of interest so that you can, where are goats going to jump, how are they going to find paths, that sort of thing. So, cue video. This is the dense mesh adapter working. You can see the speed at which it's defining the mesh and then flipping it to define the, the verticals and planes um, in a unity reality. Uh, this whole process takes less than a second. The Magic Leap device returns a mesh even much faster than this. Um, we take the extra time to turn it into a unity or, a, or an unreal set for you. But as you can see, it's pretty fast in real time. Um, you can scan a room rather than having to spend, you remember, did we all do this with Tango tablets? And you'd have to very slowly scan around the room and then start doing stuff inside the scan space. Obviously, this is a lot more fluid. OK, so once you have done that, um, you are able to now introduce elements that we know from developing games, right? We can put an object with a motivated behavior and it knows it can't walk through walls because that's what game engines give you. Next up. Um, oh, already talked about that stuff. Next slide. Oh, that was two slides. This slide, yes. Okay, so we can shoot some food out of a cannon and the goat will go find it because it's hungry, it wants to eat it, it has to find a space in the real world, it knows it needs to jump up, it can eat, it comes down, we're going to give it some more food, and it will look for that. In other words, it's a motivated agent in a very classically, this is a solved problem inside game worlds for all uh, intents and purposes. So we're trying to connect the world of MR to this solved set of solutions that are, already exist. I hear what you're thinking, and what you're thinking is, what if the goats were fired from the cannon and then abducted by aliens? And I could not agree more we had the same thought. <laughs> this is with the dense mesh adapter on. I'm so sorry you can't hear. So, I don't know, Matt Scott, but it looks to me like when you were supposed to beam the goat up into the mothership, you instead broke it into 12 tiny goats. I make no claims for the sanity of the Seattle team. I merely point out that they program like sons of you-know-whats. Okay, next up. If we now have the problem, oh, I should say this one more time. We wrote that. It's on the website. If you had a Magic Leap device, yes, that's your number one question. No, it's not available in Europe. We hope next year. Um, if you have one, we have the code sample written there. You can just, like, steal it, use it. Um, don't try to reinvent that problem. Okay, now's the question of the problem you need someone to play the game with. If I'm playing hide and seek, how do I put someone else in the environment? There are a couple of obvious candidates. Next slide. For instance, the award-winning volumetric capture solution, VoluCap, developed right here in Babelsberg, um, would be a way that you could capture someone to have in your environment with you. Um, we did a little test, let's try next, with the Royal Shakespeare Company. We asked, can we see what this looks like with a genuinely talented performer um, doing volumetric capture in your space? So. Cue it. He's going to do the seven ages of man soliloquy, cut to four for time. This is once again a real environment. That's an actual conference room in the Magic Leap offices in Florida. The little floating moats are added. The rest of the furniture is real. And we'll need as much volume as you can get. All the world is stage. And all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man, in his time, plays many parts. His act being seven ages. At first, the infant, fueling and puking in the nurse's arms, 
Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shiny morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. Last scene of all that end this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Son's teeth, son's eyes, son's taste, son's everything. So I think he does a really nice job with that performance. Um, let's go to the next slide. The drawback, as you all know, with volumetric capture is it's hard to make it interactive, right? The guy is going to give you what you recorded. Um, it used to be in this slide, it just stopped there. I will now say, um, since I got here, I was looking at some really interesting work by the guys doing the Sorcerer's Apprentice project um, out of the uh, studio here, who are working on taking volumetric character and then rigging it algorithmically so that you can then later move it, pose it, and presumably in the long, long run, make it more fully interactive um, with moments that are recorded. At the moment, it's still mostly a one-way ticket, right? He mostly is going to do what you have him do the day you capture. Other end, click. Uh, virtual characters. We've been doing this in games for, what, 25 years or more. Um, virtual characters you can script to be hugely interactive. Um, and I'll do an example from, this is sort of some of the setup from the, the game Dr. Gordborts that ships with the creator edition of Magic Leap, uh, made by our good friends at Weta. Um, and have a little think as you watch about the different layers of reality sort of in play. Uh, okay, hit it. Think about that. So, the Imperial Terran Defense Force, eh? That's the light and a bloody dangerous one of that. Successes, failures, toilet breaks, it'll all be tracked in great detail. Complete your objectives and you're bound to progress up the ranks. Assuming you live long enough, it isn't. <laughs> you will be richly rewarded. How bloody exciting is that? As if not dying wasn't reward enough. All right, soldier, to the pip, and good luck on your first mission. Oh. So one of the little pieces of dramaturgy I like about that is that by making the holograph very obviously projected, it makes the robot projecting it more real. Um, it's a fun bit of business. Last, uh, next slide. So, highly interactive, but looks like an asset from a video game, right? Um, next up, the obvious attempt is to make a digitized human that looks human enough that it feels relatable, but is in fact digital. This is MICA, another project being worked on by the team at um, Magic Leap in Culver City. Uh, this is a digital human. Can you play the movie? You should have on the side an MP4 version if it's not playing in the slide. And it's an important one, so it'd be great if it played. We'll do some tests first. So we're not the only people working on this problem, but Mike is pretty, good, pretty damn good as a new uh, current state of the art in solving it. 
Um, she will respond uh, with emotions. Um, she will turn and track you when you walk into the room. Um, she has a range of facial expressions um, that can happen in real time. And I can tell you my pers this is the one I've been waiting for us to show for a year and a half. Because I was like, oh my god, people need to see where the world is going to go. Um, what's interesting about being in a room with Micah is you do not, for one moment, think she's a person. You do think it does feel like she's a person made of light. It's a different kind of creature. It's not a human creature, but it is humanoid, like an elf. Am I betraying that Lord of the Rings thing? Um, Five years from now, we're going to, I suspect, see a lot of characters like this that will, will interact with an ever-increasing degree of flexibility with us in our environments. Next slide. Okay, so that's part of the goal, is to get something that's both relatable and interactive. So if we've talked about some of the ways we can put characters to play my hide-and-seek game into the environment, the last thing is how do we connect with that? Um, the modes of interaction. So controller we know, right? We've all done that. Hey, on this slide, it doesn't quite, okay. Totally intentional on purpose, that E. Um, we all know how to build games for controllers. We've all done that. Uh, I'm most excited about the things that move beyond controllers um, for the reasons that other speakers have said before me, to make it intuitive, to make it easier, to make it like I'm just standing here. Um, here are the things that we currently support. Controller, eye gaze, head pose, gestures, voice, and they also have a mobile app that's synced in, and a keyboard. Next up. So using controller, here's a classic. Uh, this is the one we all know how to do. Um, let's cue the trailer we made for the game um, for Dr. Gordbortz, and you'll see sort of a basic controller mechanic. didn't finish. The, the last thing that happens there that is my favorite thing is that the guy is shooting with one hand and he uses his hand, his regular hand, to throw up a force field. Um, and yes, I understand the general point about making trailers for VR experiences. Um, what I like is mixing the more natural gesture with the controller gesture. If uh, go to the next. And one more. Then we can start thinking about other ways we can mix modalities, like controller and voice, right? Um, the example you all know, everyone who's ever messed with VR has thought about, you could take up your phone and go, Wingardium Leviosa, right? I can't be the only person in the room who's wanted to make this. Um, you can track the motion and say the words, and when you say them together and work together with them, then you get a spell effect. It's magic. Um, next up. Why not drop the controller entirely? Here's another thing that we can do that you all know. These are not the droids you're looking for. Move along. We can do that, right? We, th both those sim systems are quite simple to design. It's a gesture plus a voice keyword. And we should do that because that's fun and nice. Next up. How many people in the room, um, is there anyone in the room who knows the show Doctor Who? Few, yes? Yeah, third, third to a half. How many know the episode Blink? Smattering of hands. OK, Blink is based on the greatest, super cheapest special effects in the history of cheap special effects. Basically, people are being attacked by garden statues from another dimension. I'm not even making that up. 
These are trans-dimensional beings that if anyone looks at them for any time at all, they turn to stone. But if you look away, if you even blink, they come much closer to you until they get closer and closer and closer and closer. And they close in on your heroes because you can only keep your eyes open so long. And then they use their mind powers to dim the lights. Everything gets freezing cold and they close in for the kill. Okay, so we can do all of that, right? We have eye gaze tracking. We know the instant you look away and we can bring something closer. This isn't just blue sky. I built this with the Interaction Lab team at, Microsoft, at uh, Magic Leap. Oh, previous employer there. Whew. Um, uh, so we've actually built the Blink engine, and you know, it's fun. If you want to carry that one level further, if I'm in a smart home that's connected, I can slam the AC on and cut the lights, too. Um, OK, next. I think I've made a point, generally speaking, about how your space can be turned into a stage. Um, I'm just going to extend it a couple of um, one, one or two extra turns. Um, Next. Uh, the reason I'm doing this, from the very beginning I wanted to go to Narnia or Middle Earth, and I couldn't. An extra motivator for me, this is a true story. On my daughter's 11th birthday, she came out of her room weeping. Anyone guess why, who hasn't heard me say this before? She didn't get a letter. She didn't get the letter from Hogwarts telling her that she was going to get to go. And she knew she wouldn't, except when it actually happened, and it was actually her 11th birthday, and it actually didn't happen. She cried. Anyone in the audience have kids? Does it suck when they cry? I am dedicating myself. Well, actually, I'm pretty busy. So I'm dedicating you to fixing this problem, because we can fix this problem. It is very easy for us, the people in this room, to create a CGI owl or an owl in Unity. And you can use the stuff from the GOAT technology so that it will fly into the room and not fly through things, but will actually perch where it can perch. And it can drop a letter, and the letter will fall to the floor if it's over the floor, or onto the bed if it's over the bed. And you can unroll the letter and read it and get your invitation. Then you're lying in your bedroom with your letter. My, let's call her Caitlin. My daughter's Caitlin. Caitlin's lying in her bedroom with her letter, and then from downstairs in the living room calls, uh, comes a voice that says, Caitlin, Caitlin, I need your help. Because we have an Alexa in the living room, and we can throw that voice there because your home is a stage. And when she goes down the stairs, she can find a character there who will teach her how to cast her first spell and walk her through the Wingardium Leviosa and involve her. In other words, she doesn't have to read about stupid Harry going to Hogwarts. She can do it herself. Thanks to you. So appreciate it. You will thank me when your daughters turn 11. Another thing I'd like to explore a little bit is the sense that the body, too, can be a stage. It's something that is underused, like, to a certain extent, you're adrenalized, I guess, playing a video game. When you're watching TV, you're mostly just sitting there. We don't use the capacities of the body very much. Um, in VR, you can do more. And the TP cast people were showing people doing handstands, which is awesome. But generally, there's sort of only so far you can go when, before people start to walk into walls. Um, it would be nice to use more of this. I was just at uh, Sleep No More. Uh, a couple of months ago. And one of the things I thought was um, I had just been racing at absolutely terrifyingly stupid speed down a set of stairs, and my entire, I was following a performer, and my entire body was in this incredibly primitive, adrenalized, fight or flight, hunter gatherer, stalking, killing things so that I could catch up to interpretive dance which is sort of weird. Probably that's not what we were chasing on the Serengeti. But it was really interesting to be in a game-like experience and be that physically involved. And I liked that physicality. There are a bunch of ways that we can do this, right? Hide and seek is one. That's fun. If you have those of you with kids, um, 
Everyone has seen their kids play this game in my household. It was called hot lava. You can't step on the floor. You can only step from pieces of furniture or pillows or rugs or whatever, but if you step on the floor, you're... We can build that. That's easy, right? You can put hot lava on the floor. We can all do that. Um, here's another one. Everyone plays... Uh, most of us have at one point or another played cards with a computer. Uh, true confession, if I was on a phone conference with you in the 2000s, I was playing free cell while we talked. Um, the worst thing about Google Hangouts is that you have to appear to pay attention. Um, there the computer always deals the cards. We don't have to do that. Let me shuffle. Let me deal. Let the other character bet whether to hit or stay in a game of blackjack based on the actual cards that I actually just dealt. For that matter, let her make fun of me when my dealing sucks. It's physical, that's fun, and it's hard to do in other media. You can, I had a little time reserved in the back of my head for talking to you guys about other examples of that, so remind me and we'll get back to it if we um, have time at the end. The last thing I wanna talk about is using your life as a stage, as another component of performance. I'm gonna go back and talk about Next slide. And talk about something I built for one of the alternate reality games. Um, some of you have heard this story before, but this was in a thing we built called Last Call Poker, and one of the characters you interacted with was dead. Um, it was a ghost. Uh, and he would do you a favor if you would do him a favor, and here is an example of a favor he asked of you. Um, happy to help, but I'd like you to go to a graveyard to a cemetery near you, and I'd like you to find the grave of someone who died on the day you were born, and just do something nice for them. It doesn't really matter what it is. Just do something nice for them and tell me about it. And people did this. Um, some people went alone, someone, some came with friends, some brought kids, and they went out to cemeteries and they found the grave of someone who had left the earth the day they entered, someone who had made their exit as they made their entrance. And they did a nice thing. Some cleaned up, some left a little poem, bringing flowers, cookies. Um, one person left a bottle of scotch. Um, and after the game was over, not one but many people told me that is the most profound artistic experience I've had in my life. More than any book, more than any movie. It's not because of what I made, right? We just built a container for them to bring the weight and richness of their own experience in, right? Their feelings about mortality, their feelings about their family. As a general rule, I wanna say, since we have to give over some of our power to them, we should in return understand that we can, there's a trade-off there as they become more involved and more engaged, they bring more of themselves in. And that's the thing we can use to be together, artist and audience alike, build very powerful emotional experiences. So um, I thought I'd uh, sort of wrap up by just giving a quick walkthrough of a possible class of experience that you could build that is not totally dissimilar from and yet totally not exactly the same as anything I'm actually building. Um, so, this, oh, fonts. Um, Tales from Old Gnarly. Old Gnarly is a world that is just like ours, only in that version, magic never went away. Magic was good enough that science was unnecessary. So they think of it as it's 2018 and there are witches and spells because that shit works. Here's a story called The Rat Queen. I'm... It's next week. I'm in my house, uh, it's the end of the day. Maybe I'm just in my study reading a book. Next slide. Um, and I begin to hear a sound like wind through leaves, running water. And I look up and I see there are little leaves like the leaves that are falling all the way from Berlin to Potsdam, the little golden ones that come off the poplars. And they're hanging in the wind, and a breeze is blowing. And for extra points, I turn the AC on, and the breeze is really blowing. And they drift out of the study and around the corner. 
So I follow them to the top of the stairs, and then there's a very important breaking point in the real world between people who will go down the stairs and people who will not. But for the purpose of the illustration, we're going to go down the stairs. I follow them down the stairs, and as I go, um, the unusual sounds, the woodland sounds become louder, and the trickle of water creeping down bricks, and I begin to hear sort of voices in the other place. And when I get to the bottom, there's a bit of a ripple, and I see my basement made of white brick, but it's not quite my basement made of white brick. Now there are other things in it, different things than used to be there before. And one of the things I see is myself looking in a mirror back at me, only it's myself with a beard. And he says, myself, oh, by the way, if you're wondering how do I get that image, when you sign up for a Magic Leap, you take a picture of your face um, so it can size correctly. In my hypothetical, that's how I have this face. Obviously, this would all be opt-in. Um, I see myself with a beard, and myself with a beard says, um, I know you. You and I are the same, really. And it's about our... It's about our oldest daughter. And I say, I only have two kids. And he says, well, I have three. Um, our lives have been a little different that way. But my oldest daughter was in the woods, and she was attacked by a boar, and she got a cut on her leg, and it's become infected. And I thought it would go, get better, but it wouldn't. And I don't have a magic powerful enough to fix that. But the rat queen who lives in the tower told me that you might be able to help. And I say, how would I help? He says, well, apparently in your world, they know how to do stuff to help this. So I go back to my computer, and I look up infections, and I look up antibiotics. But of course, they don't have antibiotics in their world. And I think to myself, but someone made antibiotics somehow. And I look up homemade antibiotics, which, by the way, you should not do real problems this way. Um, but it turns out there are recipes out there for how to make penicillin from moldy bread or moldy cantaloupe rinds. And so I go down and I take those things and I take them down into the basement and I find myself with a beard and say, okay, here's what I want you to try. And a couple of days later he comes back and he says, that worked, thank you so much. And it feels like there's something amazing here that we could do, and the Rat Queen has told me that you need to help her now, and it would be great, but please do what the Rat Queen asks you to do. <laughs> I think about that for a little, and then I decide, well, what the hell? So this time I climb up the stairs to my attic, and when I get up there, it's my attic, but it's not quite my attic. It ripples. Next slide. And I find myself in my attic, but there's a lovely woman in a red dress and a long, sinuous rat tail coming out the bottom. And she says, I'm going to need your help. My world is a stage. As a thought experiment, I hope that sort of gives you an idea of the kinds of things, at least, that I am working on to solve my 45-year-long problem, how do I get to Middle-earth? How do I get to Narnia? How do I get to Hogwarts? We can use the spaces that people are in using AR and MR technology, mobile, Internet of Things. We can combine those things and use them like that first slide in a cluster around the player with a player at the center. We can try to use their bodies to go beyond just controllers and use the natural ways that we creep and hide and run and step and walk the ways we are inside ourselves. And then we can also draw a little bit in hopefully a respectful way um, on the lives of the people that we're playing with and create um, something amazing together. Those of you who saw my um, talk in Qingdao know that my usual metaphor for dealing with audiences, uh, I said then that art used to be like f cooking. You make a meal and people eat it or they don't. Now art is increasingly like dancing. Um, you propose a step, they have to choose to follow. And without respect between you and the audience, you're never going to have a dance worth doing. With respect, I think there are some amazing things that we can do. And I'll stop there and see if there are any questions.
I'll also apologize for looking a little scruffy today. Um, I brought my computer recharger with a European adapter, and you can imagine if you want to really, really make fun of me, me standing there trying to figure out how I put my electric razor in the USB port and realizing that I had not covered every eventuality. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about any of that stuff? Oh, way in the back. Oh, well, that was Yoda. it was Yoda and fishnet stockings. More is the pity. Um, yes, hold that thought. If someone else has something more directly related, I'll do that, and otherwise I will tell you that story. Uh, if we don't get to it, come to me afterwards, because it's a pretty funny story, and I look really dumb. Hi, um, you mentioned before that your design philosophy is kind of having the user in the center, and you also mentioned afterwards that you create a container you don't hand it to them and they kind of interact. And you talked about the respect of, you know, between you and the audience. What I wanted to know is what your approach is to what you really want to put into the work. So what's truly you and your experience and what if from their side is not something they want to hear, but you have a feeling it's something important, something they should hear. And how do you approach that respect and what you want to contribute as a creator? Thank you. I think that's a tremendously good uh, question that is actually fundamental, not just in VR, but to the progress of art um, generally. Um, in the last talk, they said, innovations happen at the interface. And art, when it's meaningful, is in the interface between the creator and the audience. If we have no respect for the audience, um, it's hard for them to be engaged. If we abandon ourselves, we're not bringing anything. Um, when I used to teach novel writing, uh, or writing to creative writing students, I said, if you try to chase the market and make things just what you think people will love, um, and you don't sell it, you've got nothing. If you make a work that you feel passionate about and that is moving to you, and you don't sell it, you've advanced your career and your life as an artist. I do think you have to be authentically present as a creator in your objects. I think the audience always has the right to say, not for me, um, and walk away. But I think figuring out where that line is every time has to be done every time. And it's a really important consideration for everyone who works in art. I, I feel like I'm waffling, but it's just you've, there is not an answer other than to say, yes, there's tremendous tension between those things. And if you have a truth that's important, like a lot of people I know here work in, in documentary formats where they're bringing the real experiences of people who are in very difficult situations. And that is a profound and moving and extraordinary work. And I would never want to not do that. Um, I happen to be interested as a personal practice in finding a way that my obsessions and their obsessions can kind of meet. Um, but it's not the only way to make art. Something you want to know? Come Thomas? on. Thomas? Yes. Thomas. <clears throat> Thanks for uh, the great talk. Um, so um, this is very much uh, entertainment and storytelling focus, what you showed us. And uh, as we know, uh, most people currently can't afford uh, um, that kind of hardware. Uh, um, what is the go can you tell us <laughs> what is the goal or what do you, do you see as a roadmap to make this from the hardware and from the experience side come to reality for a regular customer? Oh, you put me in such a difficult position between talking as a spokesman for a company and talking for myself. Um, I think right now, I mean, everyone who develops an AR, I think this is non-controversial. Um, there are a certain kind of high quality finished experience we'd love to do in headsets. If someone came to me and said, I need an AR storytelling experience that you can make for a nickel, um, I would make them an ARG. Or I would make a transitional thing, I would use the AR on the phone. I, everyone, I know everyone in the room has this story, 
I wrote the design doc for Pokemon Go in 2006. It was called something different and it would have made me rich instead of other people. We all have this story, but this is a very cheap form of AR that's widely available now. An AR kit is really good in terms of sticking the pixels where you want them to stick. It, it works. Um, the long-term roadmap, uh, the people who want to, so I'm going to give you a Magic Leapy kind of answer. Graham Devine, who's the CCO of Magic Leap, said, um, if I drive a mile from home and discover I left my phone at home, I have to go back and get it. If I drive a mile from home and discover I left my Apple Watch at home, I don't have to go back and get it. For a company like Magic Leap or for the HoloLens to succeed on a mass consumer level, I mean, I think industry is going to happen. Enterprise is going to happen. There are just too many good use cases. For a mass consumer entertainment thing to happen, in the long run, you either have to drive the price point to nothing or you have to drive the price point to $1,000 and make it a thing that you have to drive back to your house for. Like you have to make it so ubiquitously useful. In other words, before anyone's going to routinely have that experience, they need to have the utilities, the, the equivalent of Google Maps, the reasons that you just always need that thing to be around. It's one of the reasons that Magic Leap always talks about this as spatial computing rather than as an entertainment device. I just don't have expertise on that, but I do believe that the necessary requirement is, like, these are not cheap, right? These are $700, $800 now. Um, but they are ubiquitous because they do so many things. I was in a cafeteria the other day, and it was, it was one of those places that's been production designed by a Hollywood production designer. So there was like a little globe, and there was a tea tray, and there was a book, and there was a typewriter, and there was a map of the world, and absolutely everything on the entire shelf was now done my, by my phone except for the tea tray. So. Any other questions? Are we up to the end of the time? Over there, I think. One more? One more is fine. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm very curious to know how you guys see the industry of storytelling. Because Magic Leap, you mentioned now how you see developing the stories, but also you want to engage developers to come with their apps and fill the space with their content. So how do you see it? Are you guys going to be driving the storytelling or is it sector specific? For yeah. example, digital health is going to be dominated by storytellers uh, of established companies or I'm curious to... That's a super interesting question. Magic Leap can't lead everything all the time. Like we have our focus, I'm an outlier in the company, right? I do a lot of prototyping and designing possibilities, but the f that's mostly to make sure the systems can support you. Um, we can't be the, we just don't have the resources to make tons and tons of content. Um, that's something that needs to be crowdsourced. So I think that you'll, most of our energy is focused in doing things like building the GOAT tools so that people like you can come with uh, concern that we hadn't thought of. Like yesterday, one of the, the projects, the prize-winning uh, VR project was about spinal surgery. No one in Magic Leap is going to make that project. That's a particular company or a particular point of passion. We just have to create the best possible tools and hopefully over time drive the price point down or the utility up so that there's a match that makes that a thing worth people doing. I'm sure that everyone in VR knows this conversation at another level. 